I, I tell you, one thing before we start, um, I'll just give you guys a little bit of background on um, some of the thought process that went into um, preparing um, this type of talk and this type of really a training session. Um, you know, Mike and I have worked a long time um, with a lot of folks. Um, this is our third year together at DEF CON, and um, we've really talked to a lot of people that are trying to figure out where they need to go in their careers. And, you know, the one thing that we continue to come back to is that everybody has different things that motivate them and different things that drive them. So with that in mind, we put together this training class that was really going to be interactive. And hopefully, the class itself, I mean, and I, I know three hours is a long time and there's some breaks incorporated into this, but to really get the true value out of this class for yourself, you're going to have to really commit to being here for the full time. Um, this exercise, this is something that I believe that you're going to be able to take home with, with you. Um, you can apply it to your current career. And hopefully you'll be able to walk out of here better at managing your career. Better at figuring that, you know, there's some direction to where you want to go and there's some reasoning behind it. And that you're not going to just arrive where you want to be because of dumb luck or because you're at the right place at the right time. We're hoping that through this presentation, you get a feeling of doing the things necessary so that you aren't lucky, that it's not about luck, it's because you've actually taken a proactive approach to managing your career. Yeah, and I, I think Lee, uh, just to underscore what Lee said, this is not a, this is not a talk. You know, this is hands-on. Um, we'll be passing out exercise books. Um, it's, uh, when it's time to do the first exercise, we'll pass out, um, I believe it's 15 pages of exercises. Um, we are gonna, we are gonna push you guys to work on yourself. I mean, this is, you, career planning is not a, uh, is not a spectator sport. You can't sit in, this, in the audience here and just listen to what we have to say and figure out all the right answers for yourselves. It's just, it doesn't work like that. Um, uh, unfortunately, you're not gonna get any sort of continuing education credit for this, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's no certification at the end, but uh, at the same time, you know, the reward is is effectively having a better career and liking what you do and all that sort of stuff. So, before before we get to exercises, I want to set some context. Um, Lee and I came to DEF CON last year and released a survey that we'll talk about in this first section that helps put all of the other things that we're going to do today in context. Um, this industry is a relatively interesting industry from the perspective of career development. Um, if you talk to normal career coaches and look at, you know, go to Barnes and Noble and buy your average career book, a lot of the advice doesn't work very well in this industry. You know, this is an industry that's incredibly fast moving. It's also a very young industry that has gone through a lot of changes over the last 20 years. Um, as I look at the industry, there are really three eras of information security from the perspective of careers. Um, there's that first time that was sort of pre-1994, pre, you know, really pre-internet. And when I say pre-internet, I more mean, you know, there was no Amazon.com. There was, there was obviously the internet as infrastructure and structure for researchers and academics, but it wasn't a public internet in that we weren't doing e-commerce, we weren't all sending email, we, didn't, we weren't all on Twitter. Um, at that time, being in information security was really the realm of you were either an academic um, you, or you were part of military government in some way, or you were just weird. You know, you were just a hacker who liked to do it for fun. And this is the, this is the era out of which um, all of the things that we have today, like DEF CON and RSA and SANS came from, they started out as gathering places for these weird um, corner case people, you know, whether it was academics or, uh, or researchers or whatever. Um, 
in that time, there wasn't really a career track in information security. There wasn't really any certification. Even when SANS started, it was mostly conferences more than it was certification. Um, the idea was you just sort of did it because you liked it. And if you got paid for it, hey, that was kind of cool too. And then the internet sort of came along, uh, you know, and, and security became interesting, especially as things started to get broken into more and more. You know, it was sort of, as soon as the web started to exist, website defacements started to exist, you know, and, and hackers were breaking into all this new interesting infrastructure and interesting online stuff because they could get attention. And conversely, because companies were putting money into these things, um, it became part of the company's business model to have a website, to have an internet presence, and so they had to protect it. At that point, the people who were getting hired were the same people who five years ago were doing it just for fun. It was the era of the ex-hacker. And that, I, I mean, I remember when I first came into the industry back in that time, the, you couldn't go two weeks without reading an article entitled, Should I Hire a Former Hacker? Or Are, Is It Cool to Hire Ex-Hackers? I mean, there was an article like that in every magazine, every IT website, every two weeks. Because that was the only real option. If you didn't hire an ex-hacker, you hired somebody who didn't know anything because there was no formal training, there was no formal certification, there was no, um, there was no background in it. And that was actually the time at which those things started to come up. Because, because it really was the Wild West, we started to see certifications be created. We started to see trainings happen. Um, we also started to see more corporate events. You know, because there's all this money being funneled into it, because there's so much, you know, it's all the dot coms and that sort of stuff, things like Black Hat come around. DEF CON costs 100 bucks, Black Hat costs 1500 because corporations can pay that. And they're used to paying that for other type, types of training conferences for all their people, and they're, they're okay with that. So that, you know, that gets us to like the end of the dot com bubble and, the be and sort of, 9-11. Yeah, well, I mean, and even getting into that timetable between 1994 and 2001, you know, what's happening is that, you know, you're seeing a lot of money being created um, because of the internet and because of the dot-com boom and the NASDAQ and everything like that. So the other thing that happens between 1994 and 2001, more toward the later stages, is that venture capital money starts flowing into the information security industry. I mean, you see companies that are created like Accent and ISS and RSA, and then you start seeing that wave of consultancies, the at stakes, the Foundstones, the Gardens, the Federises. So people start in the security space say, wow, I'm going to go get rich like all the software developers in Silicon Valley. And then what happens is this, is that opportunity really starts sprouting up. Because it didn't matter if you're a 19-year-old kid or a 40-year-old ex-Fed, your skills became in high demand because there was a scarcity of who you are. So what happened was is that there was more opportunity than there were people who were capable of actually t handling those jobs. And I mean, I remember I started recruiting in 1996. And I'll never forget making some of my first calls, telling people I was a recruiter that specialized in information security. And people said, what do you mean? You mean the guys, the guards, and the dogs, and everything like that? And I said, no, you know, information security, you know, hackers. So, you know, there was a different level of awareness. So, I mean, it was almost kind of like, you know, there weren't many people who set out to become information security professionals. It was something where you kind of gravitated towards it because that's who you were. That's what kind of made you tick. That's kind of what drove you. And then you get to 2001. You know, the NASDAQ plummets, then 9-11 happens. So the NASDAQ plummets has a real negative effect on our industry because all these great venture capital, all the money dries up very quickly. But then, unfortunately, or fortunately for our industry, 9-11 happens. And security becomes coffee table talk, cocktail hours. Everybody becomes that much more aware about information security because security is in the news. We're all fearful at that time. So what happens is this, is that security starts gaining a lot of momentum. In my recruiting business, 2001 and 2002 were quite busy years. And the reason it was busy because companies started to realize, whoa, 
we really need to protect ourselves. So corporate America really starts getting into the game about building their own internal information security functions and relies a lot less on the services firms and the product vendors. They start fortifying themselves. And then you start seeing a lot more, you start seeing um, the government put out um, the, um, oh goodness, that, that w the, the certain, all the universities that offered the, um, you know, the, the NSA, the NSA, you know, sort of, you know, they, they start, this becomes a real effort to start getting people educated in the field of information security. And you start seeing people thinking, wow, this is a hot career of the future. And then what happens is the certification bodies say, you know what, we could market the heck out of this stuff. We could really go out there. We have an audience. People are gonna pay money for security skills. They start releasing surveys. If you have security, you're gonna earn 20% more if you don't have security. So people say, wow, you know what? I'm gonna pay $2,000 and go to a SANS class that I'm gonna get an extra $10,000 for doing my job. That makes a lot of sense. Where am I gonna get those kind of returns? So people start looking at it, you know, wow, a CISSP? Okay, great. I have to get a CISP. I remember most of my clients back in that timetable would either A, pay fully for somebody's CISSP, or give somebody a bonus once they pass their CISSP because they were including it all in their marketing literature to their customers, to their business partners, and to their employees as a recruiting tool. We have the most CISSPs. How many companies said that? in like 2000 and 2001. Yeah, actually when I was at EnCircle in 2003, um, it was actually in our marketing literature that every one of the engineers on the in the security relevant parts of the, pro of, the, of the company had CISSPs. You don't see that in marketing literature anymore. You don't, you don't go to you know, some company's website and see them say, oh, all of our people are, C are CISSP certified or CEH certified, it, it, but at the time it was huge. So, I mean, so we actually, you know, from about 1996 to about 2000, and I guess about now, really lived in a bubble. We lived in this golden era where we were special, and we were unique, and we were untouchable. The economy couldn't affect us. And, and then the economy happened, right? And then we got slapped in the face. And so... I want to. I want to just jump in. I mentioned the survey a few minutes ago, but we, we're not doing this. Just this is not anecdotal for us. You know, we we decided to do a survey at Def, start the survey at DefCon last year, and in in sort of the last half of last year because we were tired of not seeing any real data. You know, we wanted we got up here and talked about this the last few years, and it was all based on my experience, Lee's experience, stories our friends told us, stories our coworkers told us. And we were tired of not having any real numbers. So we got almost 1,000 people to respond to the survey. And I mean, that, that's pretty impressive because it was a very long survey. It was actually, I, I mean, quick show of hands. Are, are there any people in the room that actually did the survey? Pretty long survey, right? I mean, what, 15, 20 minutes? And that's, uh, we, had, uh, we had Dr. Max Kilger helping us design it. And he basically said, we, we sort of hit the limit. You know, that was as long as you could reasonably ask people to, to devote to a survey. Without giving them a car. Yeah, yeah, without giving them, like, something major to do it. Um, you know, and obviously we're doing this because we like doing it and we want to help. And so, you know, we weren't paying people to do it. And, and for the people who just put their hands up, thank you. Because we really do appreciate it. And, and we really want to use that to give back to you guys. And I mean, uh, we, I, I, to interrupt Mike just for yeah. a second, you know, I mean, we didn't have... You know, there was no budget for the survey. I mean, we tweeted about it. We posted it up on our blog. Um, we tried to call as many. Um, Dark Reading posted it. Um, we talked to the folks over the ISSA. The people at ISC Square told us, and SANS told us that they wouldn't be a part of our survey. And I'm like, okay, you guys are ISC Squared and SANS. But, you know, so, I mean, what we try to do is that we try to go, um, we, o OWASP was very helpful, um, in sending, especially the New York chapter. So, I mean, we try to actually, with our own personal means and like our own personal favors, we try to call in as many as we possibly could to get it out to all different groups within the, you know, within the ecosystem. Um, you know, so it was one where 
you know, anybody could, it, the, the only thing that we asked people were that you had a career in information security and that this was kind of the direction that you wanted ahead. So, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't sponsor it, we didn't pay for anything, any publication, everything was basically goodwill and, um, you know, at the good graces of others. Yeah, so this is all community based and we're, we, you know, we're, we're taking this moment out to really thank everybody because it, it really did matter. And it's funny because the, the survey coincided with the economy falling apart. And obviously we didn't have a crystal ball. We, we didn't see that coming, but the data showed something really interesting. And Lee was just talking about, you know, from 2001 to really, uh, you know, last year, um, we were special and we're not anymore. And all of this is going to be very data driven. And we're going to talk about, you know, what's really happening out there. But guess what? We're not special anymore. So, I mean, just to go right here to give you some overview, right? I mean, I, I'm amazed. I run a recruiting business, right? And what I've been amazed with about is how many talented information security professionals are looking for work right now. And I'm not talking about, you know, whether it's entry level folks, chief information security officers, or anything in between. And one of the problems that's happened here is that, you know, the trickle down effect of the economy is threefold. Um, because corporations aren't spending, they're not relying on their service providers as much. They're also letting people go. They're also buying less product. So, Two of the major factors, uh, facets of the information security space, the, a lot of the real core, where a lot of the core talent lies too, a lot of that has been affected because professional services, which has always been a safe haven for a lot of information security pros, especially ones that live in remote places because they could travel, and product companies. These product companies, they're no longer, you know, they're either behemoth or they're very small, right? I mean, who would think that today that ISS wouldn't be a company or that RSA wouldn't be a company anymore? I mean, and Symantec owns, you know, McAfee, Symantec owns, you know, um, bought um, storage company. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy that security in the general software arena is not a standalone purchase anymore. And the smaller companies are having a very hard time breaking through to gain significant market share and to get to what could be an equity event, which has caused a lot of the venture capitalists to pull out their money and go out into different types of investments and invest in non-information security type companies. So what you've had is basically like a triple whammy. It's a trickle down effect. Corporations don't buy, consultants, no need, lay off people, don't buy product, no venture capital. So we just get caught in this tremendous vortex. And then, you know, th the fact is, is this, is that we've done such a great job of marketing this certification, the marketing this profession by making information security a hot, desirable, in-demand profession. I mean, we all kind of believe that, right? But the fact is, is that there's so many more of you, right? There's so much more competition out there, and there's so many less, there are a lot fewer good jobs. So people used to say, wow, there's a shortage of people. Even now, people say, you know, we have more information security work than we know, don't, don't know what to do with. I heard Alan Power at the Gartner Group tell me that the government was hiring 2,000 information security people and that they needed to do so immediately. What people fail to see is that even though they're hiring all those people, those might not be the jobs that people want. So the truth of the matter is that what I believe personally, I believe that it's not that there's not enough good people. I personally believe there are not enough great jobs anymore. There's not as much opportunity as we used to have. Our profession is maturing. And the career path is starting to gain a lot more definition. So as things become structured, it's important for us as professionals to start being able to actually work within these structures and to be able to kind of, like other industries do, 
you're going to see in the future there are going to be more defined steps to climbing the ladder, to earning more money, to getting more responsibility. They must like that over there. Yeah, apparently, um, apparently but, that was good. <laughs> but it's really important. So as you get more definition, you're going to have to start working within that structure. And you're going to, believe it or not, unfortunately, you're going to have to conform to it somewhat. Yeah, and, and the data really shows that. And I, w I just want to digress for a second before we jump into some real analysis. Um, when, when you look at who responded to the survey, um, the demographics are kind of interesting. And I think if you look around DEF CON, it's pretty obvious. Um, this is a very male-driven industry. It's also an industry that has a very high degree of education. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of the people who responded have been in the industry a while. You know, we, we had um, some more than half of the people had at least five years. So if you had done that same thing five years ago, if you had asked how many people had five years of experience five years ago, that would have been a very small number. And that's what we're talking about as far as the industry maturing, is that you know, having a lot of tenured people is going to cause more, more conformity in the, uh, in the industry. Of the people, um, you know, it breaks down. The majority of people are actually providing security for the for their, um, you know, for who they work for. Um, some smaller minority was uh, were consultants, and a very small amount of the people worked for a product vendor. We're a very well paid industry as a whole. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone probably feels like they could earn more money, but as a whole, you know, if you think of the fact that the uh, median income for a family of four in the United States is just over $40,000 a year, that more than 45% of the people in our industry make more than $100,000 a year, two and a half times the median income for, for the country, um, we are quite well compensated as a whole. Um, as far as job roles of the people who responded, that's how they broke down, you know, and it's sort of what you'd expect. The majority of people are at the bottom of the pyramid and going up from there. I mean, this is very, I mean, it's very interesting that, um, you know, when you look at the data that 30% who answered the survey were manager level or above, and 64% um, were either engineers or technical leads of some sort. So having that one to two ratio, um, I thought was pretty interesting. The other 6% were entrepreneurs, um, so they were kind of, uh, you know, CEO of everything uh, or CEO of nothing. Like, I'm the president of the company, but I take out the trash, so I don't know. But I mean, it's, it's, it was just very telling that we actually got what I feel is a very good breakdown, you know, of ha having like a, a, almost like a two to one ratio of technical folks to management folks, which I think is fairly indicative of our market as a whole. From the perspective of skills, um, I'll put it on screen. It's kind of hard to read, but we'll put the we'll be releasing these results better later. Um, it, the skills that most people the, this question was structured as: give us your number one and number two top skills that you have. Basically, if I gave you only two choices, what's what's the thing you're best at? What's the thing you're number two at? Um, the, lar the orange bars are, number are people who said number one. The blue bars are people who said number two. Um, and so network security is pretty much at the top of the list. Um, I, was, I was a little shocked that compliance and governance was second. You know, especially given the, the emphasis on technology that we all play, that so many people said that compliance was their number one, you know, their top skill or their number two skill suggests, I mean, again, I, I really believe, and one of the reasons we've done this survey is we like to see, we want to see the changes in the industry. We'll do this again in, you know, 18 months or 36 months. If I had done this same survey five years ago, we wouldn't have seen compliance anywhere near the top of this list. You know, we wouldn't have seen strategy as anywhere near the top of this list. We, we would have seen, you know, vulnerability management and pen testing and security research. We would have seen the technical skills far higher five years ago than we see today. I, I think that what this, you know, what this chart really shows is kind of the, I guess, the breadth of the people that actually responded to the survey. Um, because in my, in, in, my, in my company, as we 
look at corporations information security functions I mean this is almost very standard I mean I would think that you know yeah you know if you start looking at these skills um, and you start looking at how it's laid out I would almost say that you know most corporations you know these are the things that they rely on in kind of the weighting that they rely on them whether it's you know corporate governance and secure you know and network security and architecture and pen testing I mean all like the first five or six or seven skills were actually I, I thought fairly well represented by the skill set that I traditionally work with on a regular basis and it was interesting to see this 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 part now this we released some of this last week with Kelly at dark reading this came out last week and um, I, I could rant on this for about an hour this blows my mind that we, you know, one of the things we really wanted to understand was about job satisfaction. You know, how happy are we? And I expected security to be a community of people who were very satisfied with what they were doing on a daily basis because most of us, you know, security has this wonderful, because it's such a new industry, it has this wonderful characteristic. Not one of us probably in this entire conference or perhaps even in this entire industry was pushed into this by their parents. You know, you, how many of your parents said, I want you to grow up to be a hacker, <laughs> right? But so, so you don't, we all chose to be here. We all picked this one for ourselves. And one in two of us are not happy. Does that blow your mind? Like, I, I actually figured we, that the satisfaction chart would be like, you know, 80% of people were satisfied or better. I really did. I maybe I'm naive. Well, I but did, I didn't think that actually. This doesn't this this data shocks me a lot less than it shocks mm -hmm. Mike. I mean, because in our office on a daily basis, we're not really dealing with happy customers, right? We're dealing with <laughs> we're dealing with people who are you know either you know had had a you know had a hard time in their past company or underpaid and underappreciated and overworked. You know, we deal with like the complaint department, right? I mean, so this didn't really completely surprise me. I mean, and to give you guys a way that we phrased the question, and this is where Dr. Kilger was very helpful. It was basically, you know, in your, jo in your current job, you know, are you, you know, extremely satisfied more than is it was extremely satisfied more than oh. yeah extremely satisfied more than satisfied satisfied uh, less than less satisfied. than satisfied and significantly less than satisfied or, or somewhat something like that uh, overall um, how I'm reading overall how satisfied are you with your current position so I'll even give you guys even a little bit more into the data so 16 percent said they were not satisfied at all and uh, the number one answer was with 36% was some was oh was was somewhat satisfied then what's it called 15% was very satisfied and 6% was extremely satisfied so i mean the fact that people generally were less than satisfied or somewhere kind of underneath that you know that threshold i wasn't surprised about that but 50% is a big number, and I think that Kelly caused quite a stir when she posted that out there because that's a, you know, that's a pretty bold statement. I mean, you know, we didn't have 50,000 respondents to the survey, so I don't know if that's necessarily 100% indicative of the industry as a whole, but I mean, these are people who go to conferences. These are people who, you know, these are where, this is where we publicized the survey at places where people were, you know, dedicated to their careers. So for them to be less than satisfied, I would think that most people who come to a conference or come to, you know, or read security blogs or on, you know, the security kind of tweet, security tweets and stuff like that, I would believe that those folks are probably more than thrilled about what they're doing and yeah. less. I mean, this, go ahead. Yeah. That's coming. Yeah. That's com so, That'll come in the report. Yeah. That's coming. We, we actually, and, and I, I haven't and, analyzed that piece of the data yet. But we have some slides that'll yeah. probably blow your mind we, later. We've, we've cut the data up. I mean, a little. I, I love SurveyMonkey. Survey, you know, just a little plug for SurveyMonkey because it rocks. We've cut the data up in some really interesting ways. And we're going to give you a few of those today, but we're really, we've 
we've seen some really interesting trends on things like that. Um, so, and I, that actually provides a nice segue. Just, all right, since, since we're here to talk about career planning today, show of hands, how many people have a written career plan? I got a chuckle. Uh, yeah, I got a chuckle. Yeah, somebody <laughs> laughed. Um, and that's surprising. Um, the actual survey data, about 16% of people have a written career plan in this industry. Of the 936. But that will all change when yeah, you leave here today. That will all change when you guys leave because <laughs> that number is going to get, get messed up a little bit. Um, what's interesting about that is that even with that lack of career planning, everybody thinks their life's going to be good. You know, two-thirds of people are more than confident that they're going to reach their ultimate career goal. With no plan. With no plan. Um, more than half think that they know what the next step should be. More than half are, are confident their resume is good to go, and just about half think that their resume totally differentiates them from their peers. Now, I look With, at a lot of resumes. I can tell you that that's <laughs> bullshit. <Yeah. laughs> so... Now, people think that they're living right, but they really aren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this data just blows my mind because when we cut the data of the survey up by career plan, it blows your mind. That 16% are 20% more likely to have, 20, to have five years of experience, almost 50% more likely to be director level or above and be making more than 120 k and almost 30% more satisfied on the whole than the people who don't. Awesome. And so, I mean, the reason we decided to do career planning as this topic and, you know, as this talk is right there. The, the few of you that put up your hands have a big advantage over everybody else in this room that doesn't have a written career plan, according to the numbers. I, and, and there's sort of a chicken and egg question. Are they successful and happy and well paid because they have a career plan? Or did they write a career plan because they're the type of person who's successful, happy, and well paid? Don't know. That's not in the data. But this says to me that I damn well better have a written career plan, you know, even if it just turns out to. Well, it just, it, what it, I guess what it says is it's a worthwhile exercise. Yeah. You know, it's something that everybody, in other words, this is something that has nothing to do with external factors. You know, there's nobody you can blame for not having this. There's nobody they say, well, it's not my fault. I mean, everybody can have a career plan that suits them. And I think that's really the key is that your career plan has to suit you. And you know, what's, what's, what's good for, you know, if you look around, you know, what's good for the guy to your left, it's not, you know, might not be good for the person to the right, but everybody has some things that drive them uniquely. And that is why, you know, that, that has really been, no, that is really the driver for the exercises that we're going to go through and the, the journey that we're gonna take you on today. And, um, you know, I, I would hope that it'll be worthwhile and I hope that, you know, you'll be able to kind of just take what you learn here give you some sort of a roadmap and a framework and apply it when you get back home, when you have some more time to think about it, write some things down and figure it out in a, an environment that's a lot less rushed than three hours. Yeah, we're obviously, you know, uh, having a fully thought out written career plan is not going to happen this afternoon, but you'll have enough of a start that you can actually make it happen. Four steps to career planning. And it's truthfully, it's four steps to planning anything, but as far as a career plan, the first thing you need to do is you need to know where you are. Um, you know, you need to have a baseline. What are my skills today? Who am I today? What do I like to do? What do I want to do? Where do I want to go with my life? Where do I want to go with my life is step two. You know, we, Lee and I talk a lot. We use, we use the mountain climbing metaphor a lot because we like it. Um, if you're going to climb a mountain, the goal is to get to the top. What does the top of the mountain look like for you? Then you just figure out what the path from where you are to the top of that mountain looks like. And you set guideposts along the way so you know that you're on the path. You know, it's, it's sort of a Google Maps type of strategy, right? Pick the, pick the beginning, know the, know the beginning, pick the end, and then get all of the intermediate turns in the middle. It seems real logical, right? 
I mean, this is simplistic. Yeah, it's not rocket science. I mean, it, it, but you know what, though? As simplistic as it sounds, it's extremely difficult and very few people do it well. And I don't think that they don't do it well because they don't know how to do it. I think that they don't do, do, they don't do it well because they don't have some guidelines and they don't actually take that effort and that energy to kind of push themselves in the direction to really make them think about what will ultimately make me happy. What will ultimately get me satisfied with the job that I do? And, you know, is the end game, is, is my end game a place that I really want to end up? I mean, how bad would it be to wind up, you know, you get that big glass office in the sky and it winds up being a job that you hate? It's, I mean, that's foolish. It's the ultimate tragedy. So, let's start. Uh, step one, where are you? And I love Jack Welch. Uh, Jack Welch was this former CEO of GE. Um, I think Time named him business person of the last century. Um, Welch had some really interesting things in the way he managed his company. But one of the things that is almost always talked about when you talk, to, when you talk about Jack Welch is the reality principle. And he had this overbearing, like overwhelming need to know all the truth of where we are right now, even if it was ugly. And I think a lot of people don't want to do that. <laughs> Nobody wants to look in the mirror and go, wow, I, I'm really, you know, I, I weigh 280 pounds. I, you know, that sucks. Nobody wants to look in the mirror and go, I have a shitty job and I'm miserable and my life sucks. But guess what? If you don't know that, if you're not willing to face that, you can't do anything about it. You, well, have to, you have to face it as it is. And a lot of people don't want to admit that they're not as talented as their coworkers or that maybe they shouldn't have been the one who got the promotion. Maybe the boss made a good decision. Maybe I should have been more patient before I moved on. Maybe I should have worked harder. But people don't get that. They traditionally get it when it's too late. People love to lock the barn doors after the horses have been stolen. You know? So I think that it's one of those things where, you know, during this time, we're going to really ask you to do some self reflection. We're going to ask you to really think about you know, truly, and be honest with yourself. What am I good at? What am I not so good at? I, you know, we, we all like to talk about what we're good at. We all like to face the good side of reality, but really looking at all the parts of, the, of what is real, really looking at all the parts of yourself and your career and your job and your life and what is real right now grounds you when making decisions. You know. Uh, We'll talk later about career goals and stuff. You know, a lot, there, were, there were quite a few people who said that they wanted to be an executive. Not everybody has the talent or the skills or the inclination to be good at being an executive. I know, I know lots of really great engineers who have no management future at all that think that that's where they're going and have, I mean, just don't have, you know, some of us are talented at some things, some of us are talented at others. Knowing what you're really good at and facing that reality is really going to ground you in making all the decisions about your future. So, all right, um, I just lost the slide control here. Yay, PowerPoint. Um, I, I'm a, I, I think Dr. Phil is hilarious. So I, I had to throw a Dr. Phil quote in. I do my best to quote Dr. Phil whenever because he's ridiculous. But in this case, he has a good point. It's time to get real. So the first exercise is actually entitled Getting Real. And it, it's basically going to walk you through analyzing some of these things about yourself. Um, Jen and Andrea are going to be passing out the workbooks and, and Melina. Um, are going to be passing out the workbooks. Take them. I believe we have enough. If we don't, you might have to share. I'm sure some of you would prefer to work on your laptop than work on pieces of paper, so feel free. Um, work in whatever way is most appropriate. We're going to give you about um, we're going to give you about 15 minutes for this one um, because I want to incorporate a bathroom break because y'all have been sitting there for 40 minutes. So we'll come back about one. F Actually, let's call it 10 minutes. We'll come back about 150. 
Um, if you have questions, come up and ask, or you know, stick your hand up and Lee and I will come to you, whatever. And, you know, if you're having a hard time with it, ask questions. That's what we're here for. So take the exercise, start, start the first one. Please don't work ahead because the exercises aren't always self-explanatory, um, and we like to explain them first. Extra pens. That would have been really a smart thing for us to bring, wouldn't it? <laughs> you, you'll get some for us? All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get some. If you don't have a pen, we'll get some. There are a couple of pens up here. Um, We'll get, a, we'll get some more. The, the hotel will bring us some, but uh, for now, um, you know, make, do what you can. I might actually have a couple as well. I'll look. Um, we have not made it available online. We are going to at some point. The question was, is this stuff available online? Um, we're, has anyone out there, is anyone out there enrolled in our career incident response audio series? A couple of people. Um, so the format of that course is something that we're going to probably replicate with some of this material. Basically, we'll deliver effectively the slides um, via audio, like a, a podcast download, and um, deliver the exercises via email. It, so it's, it won't be in the same format, but at some point we will probably, in the next you know, 6, 10, 12, This is weeks, available exclusively at DEF Con. Yeah, yeah, honestly, this was, this was something we did just for DEF CON, but as we were doing it, we were like, this stuff's kind of valuable. People might get a kick out of this. So we're, we're trying to figure out what format we're going to put it in. It won't look like this, but it will be in a format that's more appropriate for delivery online. Any other thoughts or questions or stuff? All right. Um, so once you've started to talk about what you want out of life and where you are, um, the things that we like to talk about a lot are your aptitudes. People spend a lot of time in the industry talking about skills. And we talked about them earlier. I'm good at network security. I'm good at compliance. I'm good at risk management. Those are skills. But I would far rather be talking about what I call, what I consider to be aptitudes. The big things. You know, I'm good at math. I'm a good writer. I'm a good speaker. Um, I am good at solving technical problems, which I would hope most of you in the room are. That, that is probably an aptitude for most of you. And what aptitudes really are, if you break them down, are the things that you're talented at, and they're also things that you're interested in. Because we all have things that we're talented at that we absolutely hate. You know, it, it totally sucks. And we all have things that we're really interested in that we're just terribly bad at. I mean, I, I, can't, I love playing the guitar, but man, do I suck. And I, I mean, frankly, I will never make a career out of it because I know I have no talent, but I like it. And it's fun. The I mean, things that you want to focus on for your career are the things in the middle. And we call those aptitudes. On the flip side, are deal breakers. Um, they're the things that are the opposite of aptitudes. We consider the world breaks down into three, into three areas. You have strengths, things that are your strengths. You have weaknesses that matter, things that are keeping you from getting where you want to go. And you have weaknesses that don't matter. The deal breakers are generally going to be the weaknesses that don't matter. They're the things that you have no talent at and that you really don't enjoy. And you have no interest in doing. Yeah. And you, you can't tolerate. You just won't put up with it. And it's if you won't put up with it, you don't want it as part of your career. So it doesn't matter. It can't matter. If, if your career relies on you doing something that you're terrible at and that you hate, you're not going, it, your career is not going to last very long. So it's important to kind of call out what those things are. And it's important to figure out what those things are. Because if you don't, you're going to end up doing stuff you hate. And I mean, so in part of us doing this, right? So I actually, myself, went through these exercises. And I actually went through this one specifically, especially, you know, and, and, and I'm sure some of you guys have looked ahead within your, um, in your book. But um, I'm going to give you guys 
before we turn you loose on the exercise, I'm going to actually give you some of my talents and some of my interests to maybe just give you a little idea and perspective. And you know, maybe you can tie some of it in is that I'm actually pretty satisfied in my job and because it actually pulls on a lot of these things. So I mean, some of my talents. I relate well to a diverse group of people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That is a talent for me. I, 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 it's, 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 it's not really a skill, it's a talent. Um, I have a lot of self-confidence. I'm not easily intimidated. Um, I'm not bored with repetition. Um, I understand the value and have a very high, def a high level definition of what hard work is. I understand the rewards that come with it and I understand the sacrifice that, get, that, that, that it entails. I'm very good at verbally communicating to whether it's the guy who cuts my lawn or to the CEOs of companies that I represent. I'm able to communicate up and down that scale and be able to relate to those people if you're going to talk about Harvard Business School stuff or what flowers to plant. I have a very wide base of knowledge. I'm very good at negotiation. I'm very quick with numbers. I have an excellent memory about very specific data points. So I can make people feel very comfortable when I engage them in a conversation. I could remember where you went to school or how many children you have or that your kid plays the bassoon. Um, and I have a lot of attention to detail. I'm very thorough in those things. So if you think about kind of like some of the things that I do as a recruiter, what do I have to do? I talk to people all day. I have to negotiate salaries, contracts, those types of things. I have to deal with guys that work in security operation centers, and I have to go out and you know, negotiate the contracts with the large companies. So having a little bit of a breadth of kind of those types of things, they seem to kind of gravitate towards some of the talents that I have that have been developed, but they kind of are some things that have become kind of ingrained. Um, some of the interests I have, main reason I got into recruiting is that I like helping people. It's something I've always done since I'm a little kid, and it's something that's a part of my life on a daily basis in work and outside of work. Um, I love learning how businesses operate. It's a big interest. I will read any book about different business models, how they work, why they work, how people got to where they got there. I like to think that. My family and my personal relationships with my friends is a huge interest of mine. It's, it's more of a, a driver. Um, I have a circle of, I have, I'm real close with my family. I got a real good close circle of friends and people I care about. And when that happens, I just kick in. That's a huge interest. Anything that affects them is an interest of mine. I like college athletics. I played college baseball, but I like college basketball, college football. I like the idea of people playing sports. for them. It's a huge interest of mine. I go to College World Series almost every year. And I really like informal learning. I like listening to people talk and sharing experiences and trying to be able to relate to them. So, I mean, those are all things, when you start thinking about, like, kind of what it is, like, that's kind of the things that really kind of pulled me out, like, what really I'm talented and I'm good at, and what really interests me. Um, and then we talk about this other slide, right? We talked about, you know, strengths, weaknesses, weaknesses that don't matter, right? And deal breakers, right? I'll give you some of my deal breakers. Location. I have to live near a, my wife's a playwright. I have to live near a city where there's an active theater community. I can't live in Memphis, where my mother lives. I can't live in Denver. I can't live in Houston. I can live in Chicago, LA, or New York. Those are the only places I can live. I hate bureaucracy. Can't stand it. It I will never be, my company will never be huge because I can't stand all the, le the letters, the levels of people. Um, I can't tolerate people who accept mediocrity. I just, people who just show up and just do whatever's expected of them, 
and that's it, and that's all you're going to get, I can't deal with that, and I can't live with that. Um, I can't live in environments like that. I can't also live with a because I said so mentality. I can't be in a place where somebody tells you to do something, then you ask them, well, why are we doing it this way? They say, because I'm your boss. I can't deal with that. I will probably could never work in a big company. I can't stand lying and dishonesty. And I just can't stand people who are disrespectful to others. So if you took any of those things and put me in that environment, it would not work for me. It would just wouldn't work for me. So when you start thinking about your deal breakers, thinking about things that you know in your heart you can't deal with. Because those things will never change. They will never change. They are ingrained in your character. I mean, you start thinking about like some of my weaknesses, right? Big weakness of mine, big weakness of mine, technology. I struggle with it. I mean, like I'm Mike's technology jester, man. I mean, every time, I mean, you know, like I'm always like, I'm like the guy that's like, you know, we fix my computer. I, I, it's, it's really hard because I work in an industry of technologists and I struggle. I get frustrated with it. And over the last year, I've learned a lot. Um, Mike might even attest to that, but I, I've learned a lot, but it's, um, it's still a struggle for me. Um, I, um, I, I, have, I, have, I struggle with releasing control. I, I struggle with giving up, um, giving up control of things that I feel that I can do myself. I also have a hard time with foreign languages. Now, I'm never, I, let's just say this. I have no, I have a big reason to learn more about technology. I have a good reason to try to relinquish control and delegate more things. But I have no pressing need to learn a foreign language. I'm not going to relocate. We're not going to start recruiting people in France. So there's no real driver for me to learn a foreign language. You know, there are also things that I did used to struggle with that I was able to actually overcome. I was horrible at reading contracts. They would fluster me, and I would be very difficult with dealing with that. But that's something that I had to become good at if I wanted to be in business. So I had to learn how to read contracts. And it's funny, I have a friend, a personal friend of mine who's an attorney that a lot of times, it's almost scary because I use him sometimes, but he'll take some of his other contracts and let me read them now, and he say, what do you think of the contract? So it's kind of a crazy scenario. That's something I became good at. Um, I was also lousy at managing people. Lousy horrible at it. Very hard time with it. Um, and it was something that I think, I mean, maybe my employees will tell me differently, but I think that I've gotten better at it. I think that I have gotten better at it. But it's something I had to really work on to do and something I had to make a conscious effort to try to become better at. So I, I think you guys are getting an idea of what kind of stuff you should be writing in this exercise. I'm just going to interrupt Lee because I, I, I want to get us I want to get us on on track time wise. Um, I'm going to we're going to start to speed this up. So you're probably not going to finish the entire exercise, but uh, take five minutes. Um, we'll start again at 2:10. The exercise the exercise is aptitudes and deal breakers, and uh, you know flip to it. If you don't have a uh, if you don't have the the booklet yet. Um, Jen and Andrea and Melina are in the middle there. They can uh, they can give the they can give the booklet to you if you just uh, walked in. Also, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Come see us. Whatever. <laughs>